right, so now that we've talked about problem solving and decision making, let's talk about another area of our cognition, and that is language. First, we have to start off by defining what we mean by language and what we mean by communication. Communication and language are two very overlapping and similar phenomena. They have a lot in common. We're talking about language, usually defined in psychology as true human language, or when we're talking about communication or animal communication, for instance, these are both symbolic systems. So by symbols, we mean you could have vocal symbols, that is the I, E, I, O, U, or it is written symbols, or it is hand or signed symbols. Both language and communication also involve gestures. Over and above sign symbols, they have facial expressions, body expressions, postures, all kinds of gestures. Think about animal communication. The hair may stand up on the back of a wolf's neck when it howls, for instance, or just the posture an animal takes in certain communication indices. Both language and communication also have intonation or prosody. A great example of intonation is what happens to your voice at the end of a sentence. It might make it sound like you're really happy and you're confirming what people are saying. Or it may make it sound like you're really upset with what someone is saying and you don't like where the conversation is going. And so the prosody or the tone of voice can also really influence us. So both communication and language include intonation and prosody. They also include turn taking, the idea that there is a speaker and a listener or a writer and a reader, or a signer and a recipient. And so this is the idea that there is these alternating steps in communication and language. So there's four things they have in common, but what is the difference between language and communication? Well, what we consider to be a true language in psychology has grammar. Grammar is the idea that the symbols, whether they're written, vocal, or signed, they have to come in a certain order, and by changing the order, it changes the meaning. So this is the idea that I had ice cream for dessert is different than dessert had I for ice cream. And so that means something else. Although Shakespeare may craft things in different ways that mean the same thing, everyday people need to be careful about how they rearrange the symbols. Now going along with grammar, because true language has grammar, it also has generativity. Generativity is the idea that you can rearrange symbols in infinite ways to make new ideas or concepts. True language has this, but communication does not. This is the idea that you can construct a new word by combining new sounds or symbols. You can construct a new sentence by combining words in a novel way that regardless of how much a language has evolved, we can always create new words and we can always create new possibilities and new meanings. There's lots of sentences that have never been said out there that can be said. Versus in communication does not have grammar and does not have generativity. If we think about a bird song or a wolf howl, it's the idea it doesn't matter the grammar and it doesn't matter the generativity. There's only a finite number of meanings and utterances that they can make in animal communication. And the final one is displacement. Displacement is the idea that in true language, we can talk about things that are not concrete or concrete but not present. This is the idea that in true language, we can have symbolic meanings for things like justice or yesterday or next year or last century or truth or false. We can, we can make these symbols for really abstract things like morality or friendship versus uh, animal communication cannot talk about yesterday or last year. They have to live in the moment. This is also the idea that we can talk about something concrete that's just not here right now. If I were to say Christmas tree, you probably understand what I mean, even though there's no visuals of that present. And so in animal communication, we do not have that possibility. So this differences between language and communication shows that although communication is powerful, it lacks some of the things that language has. And this has been the starting point to a very hot debate in psychology about whether animals have communication or if some animals have true language. When we think about some animals, we know there's highly intelligent animals out there. As mentioned, we've taught dogs to have jobs and horses. We've taught pigeons to uh, direct missiles in the war. We know that dolphins are extremely intelligent, that many of the great apes and other primates are very intelligent and have very complex societies. 
bees also have complex societies. And then there's lots of undersea creatures like octopus that we have not even begun to understand their neurological system. So animals are smart, but do they have true language? A lot of people say no. A lot of people say what animals do is only communication, that it doesn't have generativity, it doesn't have grammar, and it doesn't have displacement. So it cannot be considered true language. And even if they do communicate a symbol that has to do with yesterday or something abstract, it's only done through mimicry, through modeling, or through conditioning and through rewarding them. A great example of this was the horse that would consider to count and do math. And this was the idea that if you said a math problem to the horse, you know, what is two plus four, the horse would begin to stomp its hoof. And it would stomp its hoof till it reached six. And everyone was amazed by this horse. And people would gather around and they would go and they would ask it a math problem. And if it was basic addition or subtraction, the horse would stomp the correct answer. So people said the horse understands what we're saying and understands math. This is amazing. It was debunked. It turned out it was conditioning, but unintentional conditioning at that. It was the idea that through the rising intonation of the math problem, what's two plus four? What's eight plus three? That type of intonation told the horse to start stomping its foot slowly. And everybody would nod. And then when the horse got to the right answer, they would exhale and send off all these nonverbal cues that told the horse to stop stomping. So the horse was smart. The horse just didn't know math. The horse knew body language and cues and what to do to get rewards. So not exactly true language. So because of that, we have a whole field of psychologists known as the nativists versus the behaviorists that argue over whether animals have true language. Nativists, led by Noam Chomsky, argue that humans are the only species hardwired for true language. Humans are born this way. We are designed to develop language. There's, there's nothing as special that needs to happen to us. And so this is the idea that within our brain, we have a cognitive pathway called the language acquisition device. And this is part of our brain that is just set and ready to be exposed to language. And whenever we're exposed to language, we're going to get it and it's going to work out just fine. Now, this is not perfect. We have discovered that not all humans learn language to the same extent especially if they're deprived of access to language. One very famous case study with a girl named Jeannie uh, is evidence against the nativist view. This girl named Jeannie was found by social workers when she was 13 years of age. She was heavily abused and neglected by her parents and was kept confined to one room for most of her childhood. Because she never heard language and no one ever spoke to her, she never picked it up. A very famous social worker by the name of Sue Curtis worked with Jeannie and worked with her for years to try and teach her language. And although she quickly started to identify nouns and identify colors and started to understand how the symbols meant for everything, after years of working with Jeannie, she could never master grammar. She could never master the who, where, how questions. She couldn't grasp that. So this was evidence against the nativist view because she was human, she had a brain, it was a human brain, but she couldn't pick up grammar. This led to the tweaking of the nativist view, to the idea that we have a critical period. A critical period early on in our infancy and childhood, we must be exposed to language in order for us to pick it up. And if we're not, it doesn't matter what our DNA has designed us to do, we will not be able to learn true language. So that's the nativist view. What's the other side of the story? Well, that is the behaviorist view. Behaviorists in the language debate believe that we are born as blank slates and it's all about our exposure. They agree that what happened to Jeannie was a lack of exposure and this early exposure can matter. Now, many behaviorists believe all we need to do to teach animals true language is expose them to true languages very early on. Some of the very early work in this was a case study with a chimpanzee. And the chimpanzee was brought into human homes and was raised as though it was an adopted human child. So from very early on in its infancy, this imp was you know, put in high chairs, the, imp, the chimp was breastfed, coddled like a baby. And just to poke fun at Noam Chomsky, who's the nativist who says apes cannot have true language, researchers named this chimpanzee Nim Chimsky. And so Nim Chimsky was the first major large scale experiment to see if apes could learn true language. It didn't work out. Nimchinsky did learn to do some sign language, which was pretty good. But 
What actually happened was chimpanzees are largely a very aggressive species, and as we learned with instinctual drift in Unit 6, eventually Nim got very, very aggressive and bit someone's finger off, kept hurting people and people needed stitches, and the situation had to be ended. The next type of big study that happened was not with chimpanzees, but was with bonobos. Bonobos are apes that are much more gentle, and they tend to resolve conflict through affection and through sexual intercourse rather than through aggression. And so the researcher who worked with bonobos was Dr. Sue Savage Rumba, and she's very well known for working with two bonobos in particular, Pambanisha and Kanzi. Now her work with Pambanisha, Pambanisha was a girl a bonobo, and she started off using what's called a lexograph. This was a chart of different pictures. And you can see down below, there's a picture of the bonobos looking at the lexograph. And so it's just a bunch of little icons and teaching Pambanisha to point at the icons to communicate rather than to sign, because the dexterity to sign is difficult, Pambanisha could articulate herself and could generate novel sentences. She could also understand grammar if Sue Savage Rumba said, Pambanisha, will you give the dog a bite of your hot dog? She could. She could understand what that new sentence meant. However, her work was criticized because the relationship between Dr. Sue Savage Rumba and Panisha was so close, it was considered that there was likely some conditioning going on there. Especially when it comes to generativity, perhaps there was a training and conditioning effect. So Kanzi was a male bonobo who actually wasn't starting off trying to be trained, but just started to pay attention and through vicarious learning picked up a lot of language. And so further studies were done, especially a video including Sue Savage Rumba wearing a welding mask and saying completely new sentences to Kanzi and trying to prove that Kanzi had the capacity to learn completely novel sentences he had never heard before and was not picking up a nonverbal facial cues by Savage Rumba. So that's a pretty convincing case. And another case that has to do with non-primates is the case of Alex the Grey Parrot. So Dr. Irene Pepperberg was a PhD in chemistry, but actually started to work with a parrot and tried to teach Alex the Parrot true language. And there's videos of Alex actually learning to construct new words. Uh, instead of, uh, for a birthday cake, he didn't know what a birthday cake was, so he called it yummy bread. You could actually vocalize yummy bread. There's also training him to talk about numbers, holding up a magnet of a purple four and an orange uh, number eight, asking him which was bigger, and he would say orange for the eight. And so being able to actually vocalize and making vocal symbols was to the advantage of the parrot. Lots of great videos out there on Pamanisha Kenzi, Alex, and Nim Chimsky that I encourage you to explore if you are interested. But be aware that the debate between nativists and behaviorists is not concluded at this point, and there is lots of complexities.